at the core beliefs, things that uh, the Bible teach that, and I would I would say this: these are these are essentials, essential doctrines. Um, because of the plainness of the Bible in how it speaks, you either believe it or you don't. And if you don't believe it, you got to come up with some reason why you don't believe it, but you'll have to come up with some extra biblical reason why you don't believe it. So I, w- I would say these are, these are absolutes and they're not something that we, that we, uh, compromise on or not something that, uh, well, you know, we'll just agree to disagree. This is what the Bible says, and this is who they, who God is, who Jesus is. And if your belief system does not believe that Jesus is God, then your belief system is wrong. And you're, and I would say that you don't, you don't understand the gospel. Only God could do what man was incapable of doing, what angels are incapable of doing. And so then we're, now we're talking about the Holy Ghost. And if there was ever a need for grounded teaching on the Holy Ghost, it is now. What the Holy Ghost is, what the Holy Ghost is not, what He does, what He doesn't do and will never do. And I'll give you for instance, the Holy Ghost will never make you drunk. Never, never, never. You will never be drunk in the Spirit. And I had, um, I, I better wait. We, we better read the scripture and I'll tell my stories later. First John chapter five, verse seven. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in the earth, the Spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree in one. Let's go to the Lord, ask His blessings. Heavenly Father, we thank You, Lord, for a warm day. And Lord, we know some cool weather is going to move in, and we thank You for that. And we, we enjoy, Lord, the changing of the seasons and the fall colors and all of those things. And Father, just remind us that there are seasons in our life as well. And I pray, dear God, that each and every one, Lord, would understand and learn how to wait on you, for you do your work in due season. You do, you bring forth fruit out of our lives when it's the season for bringing forth fruit out of our lives. And you're the one that determines that. So Father, we just ask God that you remind us daily of, of the blessings that come down to us from heaven, the blessings of your word. We thank you for the leadership of the Holy Spirit in our lives, guiding us. Uh, chastening us, convicting us, teaching us, giving us understanding, speaking to our souls. We thank you for that. And we ask you, Father Lord, to do that very thing tonight. Speak to us through your Holy Spirit, through your word. They are one. We just ask you, God, Lord, to open up our eyes and our hearts and help us to be attentive to your word tonight. Bless all those, Lord, who could not be here. We pray, Father, that you would just visit with them wherever they are, give them comfort and healing. Give them rest tonight. Father, bless those who would not be here tonight. Father, maybe neglect. Maybe they just, things got busy. Maybe things got in the way. But I pray, dear God, that you would instill it in the hearts of your people, Lord, to come together in your house to learn more about you. We need more of you, not less, in these days. So we ask this blessing in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Uh, Notice that... The, in verse 7, he calls him the Holy Ghost. In verse 8, calls him the Spirit. Those, and it's interesting, Rose came to me just before the service and she said, did you see that note on your desk? And I said, no, Callie, go find, you put a note on my desk, right? About somebody called in about the Holy Ghost. Can Callie find that? Can you find that? Just look on my desk for a a note that says the whole, I didn't see it, but she said somebody called in today was asking, asking for me. I wasn't here. I was at the hospital asking questions about the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, things like that. How many times it's found in the Bible, those exact things. And that's what I have up on the screen. And I, I don't think I announced it until 
way late this afternoon. In fact, it's 30 minutes before the service started. Uh, by the way, I got my Facebook page back. So, Pastor Mike, no, Facebook.com slash Pastor Mike Online. That's all one word. So we're streaming through there and streaming through sermonaudio.com slash Bethel. Be able to see, receive both of those live streams. But anyway, the Holy Ghost is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the Holy Ghost. It's two ways of saying the same thing. It's like saying Christ and Jesus. He is Christ and He is Jesus. He is Lord. He is Master. He is King. He is... It's just different way of saying the exact same thing. There it is. Thank you very much, Callie. Let me see this. Uh, yeah, dear, dear Pastor Mike and Lisa. Prayer is being said and being sent for all um, to work out the way the Lord has it planned. Um, sending peace and love and all of God's spirits to be double at this time. No, that's not it. That's not it. Rose will find it. But anyway, um, I want you to notice something. That I have it up there on the screen. The, the phrase Holy Ghost in the King James mentioned 90 times. Now, think of a place in the Bible where the number 90 is used and is significant. Can anybody think of a place in the Bible where the number 90 shows up in a significant way? Go. I'll give you a free DVD if you come up with it. It'll be blank, but it'll be free. The number 90. Anybody, anybody, when I say it, you're going to go, oh, yeah. Anybody? Yes. Huh? Esther 8, 9 has 90 words in it. Really? How do you know that? You counted them? Huh? Well, it's got to be, it's one or the other. That's, it, it makes a difference. Sarah was 90 years old. Oh, yeah. When what? When she gave birth. What's the connection? The number nine represents... Well, no wonder I didn't see it. You couldn't find it either. Yeah. The number nine represents fruit bearing. There, a woman... Nine months, right? Sarah was 90. The Holy Ghost is 90 times in the King James Bible. Jesus, when, when, when um, Elizabeth, or no, when the angel Gabriel spoke to Mary, he told her, blessed art thou above women, and blessed is the fruit of of thy womb, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, which was Jesus, the fruit of her womb, nine, nine months, okay? Nine fruits of the Spirit, and they're in the ninth book of the New Testament, which is the book of Galatians. That's not an accident. Those things are there for a reason. So Jesus was the fruit of the Holy Ghost, the fulfillment of the fruit-bearing blessings of the Holy Ghost. It is the Spirit that gives us life. So Holy Ghost 90 times, the phrase Holy Spirit is mentioned seven times. I'll show you something about that in a minute. Now, the, the word ghost, and the King James gets criticized by ignorant people because it uses the word ghost. And in their ignorant minds, they immediately think of Casper the friendly ghost or a haunted house where there's a ghost in it and ghosts are evil. And so ignorant people say the King James is a bad translation because it uses the word ghost and that's an evil term. They're ignorant. 
And they're not stupid. They're just ignorant. That may be willful, maybe not, but they're ignorant nonetheless. The word ghost is, it comes to us from the Germanic language, Geist, and it simply means spirit or a breath or, or a, like a, like a, when someone is aghast, okay, when you are aghast, you go <gasps> like that and, and air moves in your mouth. There's always air traveling fast when you're aghast about something. Okay? So that's, and those terms are related. So the word ghost simply means spirit. The word spirit itself, spirit, ghost, the Greek word is pneuma. What does that sound like? Pneuma. Huh? No. Pneuma. Pneumonia. You guys are not with it tonight, I can tell you that. Pneumonia. What is pneumonia? What does it affect? Your lungs, your breathing. Have you ever used pneumatic tools? How do pneumatic tools work? They're powered by air. And so the Greek word pneuma, the Latin word spiritus, spirit is where we get the word respiration means to breathe so the word spirit the word ghost the word pneuma all of these words speak of breath or air or wind turn to uh, turn to john 3 john chapter 3 and this maybe will help you understand what jesus was talking about John chapter 3, there was a, a verse 1, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the, the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. Notice capital S. So he's talking about the Holy Spirit. Of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. How is it that Mary ended up conceiving a child? The Mormon version is... They have this God named Elohim physically coming down to Mary's house, knocking on her door. And when she opens the door, he goes in there and lays with her. That's the Mormon version of it. That's wicked. Of course, that means she's no longer a virgin. But the Bible version of it is, is that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Ghost. And I want you to think about this for a minute. What happens at conception? The mother donates 23 chromosomes. The father then donates 23 chromosomes. And what those are is bundles of words in sentence form that make DNA that are writ that's written like a book. What did the Holy Ghost do with Mary? Gave her the Word of God. Because 1 John 5, 7 says that the Father and the Word and the Holy Ghost, though being separate, these three are one. You can't, and, and I'll say this, I, I said this about Jesus. You cannot separate Jesus from the Bible. You cannot separate the workings and the speech of the Holy Ghost from the Bible either. Let me ask you a question. Who in here be firmly believes that you know the Holy Ghost has spoken to your soul? Who knows that? I do. I believe that. I didn't hear it with my ears. I heard it in my inner man, my soul. Now, if we hear something, we, we think maybe it's a thought that popped into our head. But what it was, was the Spirit. Now, there's a way to know whether or not it actually came from God's Holy Ghost. How do you do that? 
Check it against the written word of God. If the Holy Ghost spoke it, you're going to find it in the scriptures. So the Bible says, test the spirits to see whether they be of God. The many spirits, many false spirits are out there. Devils are lying to people every day and people are believing that that's the Holy Spirit, but it's another spirit. And they refuse to check it against the written word of God because in their belief system, the word of God is not really the word of God. They don't believe it. They believe it's got mistakes in it or that it's or God is bigger than the Bible somehow or whatever. But you have evidence, 1 John 5, 7, that the Holy Ghost and the word of God are one and the same, which is probably why 1 John 5, 7 is not found in any modern translation of the Bible. It's probably why they took it out. So that people then would remove their, in their minds, they would, they would reject the idea of the Holy Ghost speaking to them by way of the Word of God. God still speaks, but He speaks through the written record of the Word of God. So, John chapter 3 again. Uh, Jesus, in verse 5, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. If you were not saved, if God did not lead you to salvation with the Word of God, I would seriously get on, I would get on my face before God and say, God, save me. Put your Word in me so that I can be saved. The Spirit and the Bible, the Word of God, are one. So he says, verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. And the two are, they're different from one another. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. Now look at verse 8. The wind bloweth where it listeth. And thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Notice that he connected the, the idea of the Spirit with the blowing of the wind. So Nicodemus answered and said unto him, how can these things be? And Jesus went on to talk about how he's the only, only begotten son. So anyway, so the Holy Ghost, understand this, rule number one, the Holy Ghost is God. And God is the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit are the exact same thing, similar to Christ and Jesus are the exact same thing, and so on and so forth. Now, Revelation chapter 4, we're going to get a sort of a visualization of the Holy Spirit. And here again, we're going to understand that the Holy Spirit and the Bible are one and the same. In Revelation chapter 4 John is carried away in the Spirit, in the Spirit into heaven. That's what he says in verse 2. Behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. These three are one. One sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. That sort of matches what Ezekiel saw in Ezekiel chapter 1, where he saw the the Son of Man, one like unto a man sitting on a throne with a rainbow over his head, and so on and so forth. And then verse 5, And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now, again, that's interesting, seven spirits, and the phrase Holy Spirit is mentioned exactly seven times. In the King James Bible, I don't think that's an accident. I think, it's, I think it's there for a reason. I think it's that way for a reason. So John sees seven lamps in the wilderness tabernacle that was represented by seven candlesticks, what they called the menorah. And there were seven candlesticks and they were fed by 66 decorations on there, fed by olive oil. They burnt olive oil. That's what lit the lamp inside of the tabernacle. And the tabernacle never, the light in the tabernacle was to never go out except they moved the tabernacle. When they had to pack everything up, then the light went out, they moved, they set it back up, they relit the lamps. And that lamp, those seven candlesticks, was the only light source inside that tabernacle. There was no window, 
There was no lantern hanging on the other wall. Nothing. The only source of your light should be the Holy Spirit by way of the Word of God. So those seven spirits, turn to Isaiah chapter 11. The Bible uh, lists each one of these spirits, identifies them, tells you what they are. I love this. I love this Bible. I'm remembering that verse 2 of Isaiah 11 has exactly 33 words in it. Exactly. Jesus was 33. And He is the fulfillment of what we read here in Isaiah 11. Isaiah 11 verse 1, There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of His roots. The branch, capital B, that was Christ. And it says in verse 2, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And so there up on the screen, I separated them out. Number one, you have the Spirit of the Lord. What is that? The Spirit of the Lord is, number one, you correctly identify the name of your God. The name of your God is the Lord. Jesus was called the Lord all throughout the New Testament. The Lord Jesus Christ. So that identifies him with who the Lord is. So at number one, it identifies the correct name of God. He is Jehovah and he is the Lord. But it also establishes his authority. When you are when you have the Holy Ghost of God dwelling in you, then you understand that God is your Lord. Now, in this country, we do not have lords. We left that in England. In England, they have lords. And lords have authority granted to them. In fact, the, the British Parliament has two houses similar to us. One is a house of commons, which is elected by the people. But then there is a, a higher house, and it is the house of lords. And those lords are granted that title by birth. They were birthed into a sort of a semi-royal family. They are never elected. They have that authority given to them by birth. And they actually have sort of a higher authority than the House of Commons does. So to us, we don't really understand the concept of a Lord, but a Lord basically is a king. He has absolute and total authority over your life. God is the one who says what you're going to do and what you're not going to do. God is the one who allows something in your life or doesn't allow something in your life. God is the one who restrains you or who, or who pushes you forward. God is the one who lays out rules and guidelines for you to live by. God is the one who says, you did that and I told you not to do it and I'm going to punish you for it. He can do that because he has the authority to do that. And one of the things that we know about what makes a born-again Christian and what doesn't make a born-again Christian is someone who is faking Christianity refuses to be under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. They refuse it. They refuse it because they do wrong and they don't, they will not allow God to chastise them for their wrongdoing or they'll try to cover up their own sin. But because Jesus is Lord and God is Lord, He's King over our life, that means He has absolute authority over our life. And if we will not abide by God's conditions and terms, then we must suffer the punishment of everlasting fire. So, number one, you know you have the Spirit in you when you recognize that Jesus is your Lord. He is the absolute... And by the way, since Jesus and the Holy Ghost and the Father are all one, the Word, then that means the Bible has 
absolute authority over your life. Absolute authority over your life. If God says it, you must believe it. And if you refuse to believe it, then you're going to suffer the consequences for that. And I mean in every aspect, in everything, whether it's the flood, the creation, the time of the Bible. We, I mean, who in modern times now believes that we were created by God 6,000 years ago? They ridicule, publicly ridicule people nowadays for believing that the earth is only 6,000 years old. Ridicule people for that. Whereas a hundred years ago, that was a common idea. Darwinism had really taken off too much. People were still believing the Bible. They were still believing that we had a creator. Wasn't until Darwin came along and others followed in his footsteps to say that maybe the earth wasn't 6,000 years old. It was millions of years old. That's, that's how all this, these evolutionary accidents took place. I don't believe that. You shouldn't believe that. You should believe exactly what the Bible says about everything. Jesus is Lord. He's King. Number one. Number two. Spirit of wisdom. And by the way, all of these point you back to the scriptures. The spirit of wisdom. The fool has said in his heart... There is no God. And again, it's about belief. The fool says, I don't believe in a God. I don't believe in God. I don't believe in a deity. I don't believe in higher power. I don't believe in any of that. That's a fool. That's somebody who is the opposite of wisdom. Spirit of wisdom comes into you. Wisdom comes from, uh, in fact, turn to uh, Proverbs. Turn to Proverbs chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4. <laughs> the book of Proverbs tells you where wisdom comes from. Uh, chapter 1, verse 20. Wisdom crieth without, she uttereth her voice in the street. She crieth in the chief place of concourse, in the openings of the gates. In the city she uttereth her words. Her words. Wisdom comes from the words of God. How long, ye simple ones, will you love simplicity and the scorners delight in their scorning and fools hate knowledge? Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit. See it? I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. The spirit of wisdom is in the words of God. Reject the words of God. You have rejected the spirit of wisdom. This, the third one, the spirit of understanding. Wisdom, understanding, knowledge, they sort of all go together. Knowledge is knowing what the Bible says. That's knowledge. Being able to quote verses. I'm going to challenge, I'm going to, everybody look up here for a second. I'm going to challenge you. It'll make you nervous. Who can quote five verses from memory from the King James Bible? Just five verses. Who can do that? One, two, three, four, five. What about you people online? Who can quote five verses? Verses from memory, from the Bible. You don't have to know exactly where they are. Just five verses. Now, I'm your daddy. I love you. I'm going to chasten you a little bit. Learn this Bible. Learn it. Learn it means reading it. Turn Dr. Phil off and read the Bible and read it again and read it again and read it again. Five verses is easy. I should have said ten. 
I have met people who could quote entire books from memory of the Bible. I can't. But the spirit of the spirit of knowledge is knowing what this Bible says. So when someone presents to you a doctrine, an idea, a philosophy, or you see it, you're thumbing through Facebook or Instagram or something, and somebody presents to you an ideology, you can know instantly whether or not, and I use the word know, you can know instantly whether or not that statement is true or false Because it's either going to agree with the Word of God or it's going to disagree with the Word of God. So, um, Jenny, I think Jenny Geltz said this. She heard a pastor, I'm getting his third hand, fourth hand actually. I think she's the one that said it, but she said that uh, she heard of a pastor who said, I would rather see two men holding hands than two men carrying guns. Now, what do you know about that statement? Is it right or wrong? It's wrong. But can you, do you know it from the Scripture? Have you read that from the Scripture is my point. Okay, I'm not saying you can, I know it verse, I know the verse, I know the place, I know what page number it's on, I know exactly where it is. But do you know that from the Word of God? Because the deceptions that are present now and the ones that are coming are taking a lot of people, they're sweeping them away. When the Mandela effect showed up, people saying that somebody went back in time stepped on a butterfly, erased some verses out of the King James Bible, so now the Bible's different. We don't have the Word of God anymore. I don't have to analyze that statement. I know it's false. Forever, O Lord, Thy Word is settled in heaven. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever heaven and earth shall pass away but my word shall not pass away now i don't know exactly where that verse is but i know the verse and i know for a fact that god's word will never corrupt ever that's the spirit of knowledge that's what i'm trying to tell you and you cannot have understanding and wisdom and counsel without knowledge If you come to me with an issue that's going on in your life, I'm going to give you scripture. I'm going to be shooting up flares to get God's attention while you're talking to me and I'll be going, God, hurry up. Give me a, give me a verse here. Come on. I need help here. God, I'm not smart. Help me out with a verse. Boom. God will give me a verse. It's the word of God. Knowledge of it then will give you A spirit of counsel. The Holy Ghost is your counselor. Now there's nothing wrong with human counselors. Okay? In, in a, in the right setting, the right context. I, the Holy Ghost may or may not show me how to change the oil in my car. But if I need to change the tire of a car or something like that, I might need somebody to counsel me on how to do it. I pull up YouTube, find out how to do it. But I'm telling you, on serious life matters, you need the spirit of counsel. Jesus is that counselor that God sent from heaven. So wisdom, understanding, counsel, and knowledge just seem to be rolled together in the same package. Knowledge comes first, then you'll have understanding, then you'll have counsel, then you'll have wisdom. Wisdom is you making the right decisions based upon what you learned from God instead of the stupid decisions that you made. Why do you keep making the same mistake over and over again? Why don't you do it right this time? Is the spirit of wisdom. And then we have the spirit of might. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. 
it, when you study the life of Samson, you go read the, that story. Judges chapter 14, 15, 16 in that area. When you read the story of Samson, the strongest man in the world, you'll see that every time he needed the strength, the Bible says, and the Spirit of God came upon him. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he slew the Philistines. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him. What was it that Samson had on his head? The seven locks, which are a type of the seven horns of the, ra of the Lamb in, in Revelation 5, which are the seven spirits of God. And he was shorn of those seven spirits and he could do nothing. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand tonight, but who struggles with sin? Who struggles with things that are wrong? Who struggles with attitudes that are wrong? Who struggles with a mouth that, that says wrong things? Who struggles with those things? You do not have power against sin except you have the spirit of might in you. And the spirit of might is the word of God. And then the seventh one is the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And I fear the Lord. I mean, you know, I'll be honest. Days gone by. There have been times when I thought about ending my life. Thought about it. What kept me was the fear of the Lord. Because I know there's three people in your Bible that committed suicide, ending their own life, and all three had been rejected by God. And I didn't, I didn't want that. They had come to a place where they said, God cannot fix my problem, so I'm just going to end it. Saul, King Saul, rejected God. Judas Iscariot rejected God. Satan entered into him. An evil spirit entered into Saul. Ahithophel was David's counselor. He rejected David and went to Absalom. Absalom's the type of the Antichrist. And then when Absalom threw him to the curb, Ahithophel put his house in order and went and hung himself. Cursed is anyone who hangeth. So I had the fear of the Lord in me, knowing that that's not God's way. And whatever problems I was facing at that time, I realized that hell was much worse than what I was facing. So I didn't do it. And I'm not saying I dwelt on this for days and days, it, it just, but it was a bad time. Other things that have, I've encountered in life where I knew not to cross a certain line with God. God draws a line and He tells you, do not cross that line and I know enough about God and how he works to tell you that when God is ready to chasten you he'll do it he's not afraid of you but you better be afraid of him a healthy fear of the Lord and notice that he uses, uses the word Lord not God the fear of the Lord. If he's Lord, the Queen of England, you know what power she actually has? Todd, you know what power the Queen of England actually has? None. None, really. She's a figurehead. She's the Queen. They love her. They're not going to get rid of her, but... She can't snap her fingers and command the armies to take over the parliament and the nation. She can't do that. 
So, I mean, they love the queen, they respect her, but Parliament doesn't fear the queen taking over because she doesn't have the teeth to do it. She doesn't have the force to do it. doesn't have the sword to do it. Jesus has the sword. And he'll do what he said. And I fear him as a result. So these are the seven spirits of God. When they are in you, they operate in you and they, they teach you. When you're reading the Bible, they teach you. When you're reading scripture, the Holy Ghost is there breathing in, breathing life into your soul, into that new man that's in you. Giving you understanding, giving you knowledge, giving you counsel. God, what am I supposed to do? And then one day you read the Bible and the answer is right there of what you're supposed to do. And you, thank you, God, I'll do that. When those things are in you, that is the sign that you are saved. Lost people do not have the Holy Ghost in them. They do not. Uh, John 14, very quickly, we'll do a little bit here and then we'll leave off. Save it for next Wednesday, but turn to John chapter 14. One of the greatest, I think, one of, one of the greatest acts of the Holy Spirit is that He is the Comforter. We like comfort. We're not designed... And I watch a lot of wildlife on YouTube and I see leopards laying on a tree limb. That is not comfortable. I don't know how they do that. I cannot... If you've ever sat in a tree waiting for a deer to show up, and I mean on a tree limb... That is not comfortable. We like our comfort. We like our bed soft, couch fluffy. We like comfortable clothes. We like comfort. We like comfort hugs from people. Come here and give me a hug. And that brings comfort. My wife has an amazing power over me. And I'm not kidding you. She has the ability to come to me and put her arms around me. And almost instantaneously, every fear and every problem I have is gone. Because she, God designed her that way, to be that way for me, to bring comfort to me. So John 14, verse 15, If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and He shall give you another comforter. Je he's, Jesus is going to leave and the Spirit then is going to descend. And the disciples were going, why, Jesus, why do you have to leave? Be, because I'm in this man's body and I can't be everywhere all at once. So, But when the Comforter comes, He will be everywhere at once. So the Comforter, and I will pray the Father and He shall give you another Comforter that He may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth. There it is. Jesus said in John 17, Thy word is truth. So the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. That's exactly what I just said. Lost people don't have the spirit. They never will. They cannot receive the spirit of truth. Because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day, ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. Sounds a little complicated, but Jesus is in the Father. We are in Jesus, and He is in us. How can he do that? He's Jesus. He can do it. He that hath my commandments, meaning the Bible, and keepeth them, meaning you're never ever going to turn your back on the Word of God. You're always going to know the Bible's the Word of God. 
and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. So there's several things here, but one of the things that the Holy Ghost does, he teaches you the Bible. The Holy Ghost is your Bible teacher. The Holy Ghost is your commentary. The Holy Ghost is your teacher, your professor, your, your language instructor. The Holy Ghost is your history teacher, your biology teacher, your science teacher, your math teacher. The Holy Ghost shows you an and... We'll see this later on, but not tonight. The Holy Ghost will show you what's going to happen in the future. Who wants to know what's going to happen in the future? Um, we're going to take prayer requests, but I can tell you, you can believe this or not, I can tell you that our government has actually spent money with programs such as remote viewing, the ability to see into the future, our government wanting the ability to see into the future in a occult, esoteric way so that they could know what the Russians are going to do or the Chinese are going to do or the North Koreans are going to do. And I'm not kidding you. Why not just read the Bible? Who has prayer requests tonight? Go ahead. I got little doodads going up by and down my back. I will. Okay. God's good. God's playing chess and he's moving both sides of the board. Okay. Hyun me. Okay. All right, pray for Hyun Mi. She's got a lot of things going on, so pray for her. Rose. Nancy, okay. Your daughter, Nancy. All right. Two tests tomorrow. Who else? Sparky? Okay. Courtney Unspoken. Christina? Pray for Abby. Pray for my wife. Still, she's still in a lot of pain. She should have been at home this week down, but that happened with her mom and her dad. So she's been up all week, and that drain can't come out until she stops draining fluid from where the surgical wound is. And so it's kind of set her back in her healing, pray for Gloria. She's on the men. She got a new pacemaker, and that's evened her heart rhythm out. And we praise the Lord for that. Uh, pray for Brother Sterling. He had some cancer spots removed. Let's pray that that doesn't come back again. I hate cancer. I hate it. I hate cancer. So pray for him. Pray for Cubby. He's got some medical things going on. So lift him up. Melissa. Pray for Philip. Lift him up before the Lord. Pray for him. Okay? He's a man that has a lot of struggles and conflicts. And I believe God's greater than all of those. And I, I, I believe that God will ultimately be powerful in his life and save him. 
He did his Uncle Steve. And if he can save Steve, he can save anybody. Okay? So we're going to pray for Philip tonight. Who needs prayer? Amen. Well, I'm glad you came. So let's come in and pray tonight. Pray for Robbie, Robert, Bobby. Uh, we gave him two nights in a hotel that should have ended lat, uh, Tuesday night. We don't know where he is. We don't know what's going on. I believe he wants help. So we're going to pray for him. We're going to pray for the people who are selling methamphetamine in this neighborhood. We're going to pray that they stop. Pray that they run out and they stop or get saved or whatever. But I hate that stuff. I hate it. I hate it in our neighborhood. I hate it in our county. I hate the drugs. I hate them. They're evil. So pray for, pray for people tonight, all right? Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight. We thank you, God, for the goodness that you are to us. Good blessings that you give us. Father, we can't, when we count our blessings, they're more than we can count. We have life. We have love. We love others. People love us. We have blessings of family. We have blessings, Lord, of the liberty that we have in this country, that the blessings of the gospel, blessings of the word of God. And Father, I pray that you would just compel each and every one to read their Bible. God, I understand that I understand the the struggle to just read the Bible. I understand it. But Father, we're living in times now where the only thing that's going to keep us is the Word of God. The only shield that we have is our faith in the Word of God, our trust in it. And I pray, dear God, that you would just compel your followers, your people, your children. Give them the spirit of knowledge. And then by that, the spirit of understanding. And then by that, the spirit of counsel. And then by that, the spirit of wisdom. Give them the spirit of might, Father, to stand against all the evil that comes against them in their life. Father, thank you for the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Father, I've been on the receiving end of your rod before. And I don't like it. But Father, it's necessary to chasten me, to bring me, Lord, to... Serving you in an honest way. Father, I pray, Lord, for the needs of the people that have come here tonight. For those, Lord, who just raised their hands, said they need prayer. Whatever, Lord, the issue is, whatever the need, you know it. And they're speaking it to you right now. And God, I pray that you would hear them. You would love them. I love them, Father. I would, I would do what they ask. If I could. So Father I know and believe God. That you'll do what they ask. Or you'll do better than what they ask. Father teach us to trust you. Teach us to rely on you. Teach us Lord Father to know your ways better. Help us dear God to share the things. That you have taught us with other people. Who need to hear it. Father, thank you, Lord, for the lady that called today and she just wanted the right videos to share with people who have fallen, Lord, for these false Bibles. I pray, dear God, that you'd bless her and use her. Father, we thank you for all those who join with us each and every service. Thank you, God, for giving us our Facebook page back. Father, we pray, dear God, that you would use that for your kingdom and your glory. And don't let Satan hinder it. Father, help us to reach out 
wherever we can to touch more lives, to speak to more people. Father, to convince sinners that they need a Savior, to convince the doubters, Lord, that they need a Bible. And I just pray, dear God, that you would continue to use us. Bless our Kenya ministries, our radio stations. Bless us, Lord, as we go over the airwaves. I pray, dear God, that our enemies would turn into friends after hearing the gospel and hearing the word of truth. Father, we pray for the children, Lord, that you allowed us to rescue. We pray, dear God, that you would continue to bless them, nurture them, help them along in life. Father, bless our homes, our families, our wives, our husbands, our children, grandchildren. Father, we've just prayed, dear God, that you would bless the work that you've given us to do. Lead us and guide us, Lord, in that work. Show us what you would have us to do each and every day. Forgive us of our sins. Forgive us, dear God, for failing you. Forgive us, dear God, for not standing up for you when we should have. We just pray, dear God, that you would help us along in life. We love you. We ask, dear God, for your comfort and your grace. Bless those who are sick and give them healing. Bless those who are mourning. I pray, dear God, that you give them comfort. Bless those, Lord, who have sins. I pray, Lord, that they would be forgiven. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 Say, Amen. 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 Like little chicken. Back, 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 back.